Now we'd like to ask Ethan to come back up and give us an overview of what's happening in the US. Ladies and gentlemen, Ethan Naderman. Well, thanks, Grant. Um, I don't know if there's a hell of a lot to say. I mean, what happened in the US back, I think, in the late 80s, early 90s, was the federal government passed the Controlled Substances Analogs Act to try to get ahead of the curve, to try to criminalize any new substance. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it didn't seem to prove very effective. There's been a proliferation of these substances since. When I think about the consequences in terms of my own work, probably the principal consequence was at the time, and many of you may know, know the name Sasha. How many people know the name Sasha Shulgin? Just raise your hand. And for those of you who don't, he is uh, the brilliant genius, really, um, who had d devised uh, more psychoactive substances, hallucinogens, in his backyard laboratory than all other scientists put together in human history. And also the one who's discovered the medicinal, or the medicinal and psychoactive value of MDMA. And until the late 80s, he had um, basically discreetly worked with people at the DEA. He had friends in the DEA regulatory side, not the enforcement side. And they would sometimes ask him to assess the quality of the drugs, weird ones they were finding on the streets. And I had, was teaching at Princeton at the time, and I had put together a working group of distinguished academics to think through what would be the optimal drug policy. And a few people suggested that I ask Sasha Shogun and his wife Anne to join. And people said, oh, no, he won't do it. He keeps a low profile. Then the feds passed that Controlled Substances Analogs Act, and he joined like that, because he felt that basically the federal government had criminalized his research, and that his research was not just about finding all sorts of ways for people to get high. It was also about the potential uh, incredible medicinal value of these substances, as Rick Doblin talked about during the lunchtime session. So what's happening right now is that these substances have proliferated. Uh, synthetic cannabis had a lot of attention. K2, spice were the names that were applied to them. Then you got uh, bath salts became the new uh, phenomenon. I think cathinone-based thing and all sorts of stories coming out. Then there's what we now call, or the word was devised by somebody at the harm reduction group, I think Dan Safe, what we call the alphabetamines. In other words, substances like MDMA with all these alphabet letters, but with an amphetamine base, a stimulant base. And obviously, every time you change one little molecule, that may put it then from the black area of the law into the gray area of the law. So there's a proliferation of these substances. And unfortunately, lack of quality control on what's being produced. And unfortunately, you know, some young people who will, you know, have parties with people will have a bowl of pills and they'll just take some for the hell of it, not exercising even the most minimal cautions. So there's a f the, the bad news is, is that right now there are two bills being introduced that have been introduced in the U.S. Senate. Uh, you don't need the details, but SB 1322, SB 1323, um, and introduced by some of the pro-drug war Democrats, our New York State Senator Schumer, my state, New York, uh, California Senator Dianne Feinstein. These are kind of the, the Democrats who go overboard and don't want to be in terms of almost outflanking the Republicans on being pro-drug pro war, the ones who have pushed the uh, mandatory minimum sentences that have filled our prisons. And they're responsive to political pressures at times, but their tendency is that knee-jerk criminalization of whatever comes along. And so the DEA, I understand, is feeling somewhat confident that they will just be able to slap the next layer of criminalization on these things. To, for example, shift the burden of proof of showing that these things are not being designed for human consumption or whatever onto manufacturers and on setting up uh, an oversight body that's overwhelmingly DEA driven. I don't necessarily have a major issue with the guys in the DEA who work to enforce the laws. I mean, we do have federal drug laws. Somebody has to enforce them. So be it then. The real problem with the DEA is the leadership role they play on the regulatory issues, the ones that Rick Doblin alluded to, the, the ways they, they provide obstacles to proper access to pain medications, the way they block research, the way they do all these sorts of things. And that's where the DEA has been a highly proactive prohibitionist agency um, that goes to that issue of whether the proper role of law enforcement is to enforce laws or to become advocates for the expansion of criminalization. Uh, I don't know what will happen with these two new laws in Congress. 
Um, there's a decent chance that they will fly through. There is almost no organization working to oppose this. My organization, the Drug Policy Alliance, is becoming increasingly involved, but have not yet been able to focus on it. For those of you who want to interact with my organization in this area, my two colleagues focused on it. One is Stephanie Jones. The other one is Grant Smith. Their emails are sjones at drugpolicy.org and gsmith at drugpolicy.org. So we're doing what little we can. We have had some success in trying to moderate some of the federal legislation. The question I'm wondering about is whether or not there's any potential because of our federal system to try to do some reforms at the state level. You know, what we've done with marijuana, right, where the states provide the leadership and ultimately we hope the national government will follow. Because food and drug regulation is such an entirely federal issue, I'm not sure that we can get traction there, but I hope that maybe with this breakthrough in the Justice Department allowing Colorado and Washington to proceed, and as I said earlier, in saying that if the focus is really on protecting public health and safety, then we have to look at the potential value of a regulatory approach, proving better than a prohibitionist approach in accomplishing those ends. So we're gonna try to see if there's any traction to be gained at the state level. We're gonna do our best to educate um, American legislators. Uh, with the New Zealand model, virtually nobody knew about in the US, and so we were able to bring people to the US with the help of Star Trust. Um, we were also able to get the AP, the Associated Press, to cover, to produce a favorable report which went around the world globally. So we really see part of our mission in the U.S. as really trying to popularize awareness of your model here and to work to either modify the prohibitionist legislation that's coming through or to block it and to increase interest in this type of work. Thanks. You guys feel a little bit proud? I feel pretty proud, eh? You know, a lot of people in New Zealand, yeah, you know, they don't realize just how uh, world-leading this policy innovation is. And I think probably now, um, maybe thanks to some positive media that we're starting to get, people are starting to recognize that, and I certainly hope so.